Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill and thanks again for sponsoring the show. If you want to feel the wind blowing through your hair and see the great city of Nashville at the same time, check out Nashville Scooter Tours. Trekking through the downtown streets to Music Row with Nashville Scooter Tours is safe, eco-friendly, and a whole lot of fun. They use Xenon electric scooters that go 55 miles on a single charge. Find out more by calling 615-290-5563 or book your reservation today at NashvilleScooterTours.com. You're watching Music Business Weekly. Our guest, founder of Hard Rock Cafe and the House of Blues, Isaac Tigret. From the family grocery hauler to fire-breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rem Speedway. Highland Rem Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stock car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Howdy everybody, welcome to What's Up Nashville. Now normally we tell you all the hot stuff that's going on around town this weekend, but we have an exclusive, okay? This is one project so hot, so important that we're gonna dedicate the whole show to talking about Project Nashville Skyline. Welcome our guest, the one and only Isaac Tigret. He did, he is the founder of the Hard Rock Cafe and House of Blues, so he knows a lot about um, music and founding companies. And his uh, partner Swan Burris is in the studio today. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for being on the show. This is so terribly exciting. Swan, tell us, how did this project uh, come together? Uh, it came together by the fair board looking for ideas for the fairgrounds. And I submitted an idea to create music venues for the fairgrounds uh, to help celebrate that we're Music City and create a world-class destination uh, for the people of Nashville and for the tourists. And so uh, I got accepted with the idea, they liked it, and I felt like that the, uh, the one and only person that knew how to do this well, that had done it, uh, was my friend Isaac Tigret. Um, we've known each other almost all of our lives. And uh, so I called Isaac up and I told him what was going on, and I explained, you know, it's music venues, et cetera. And uh, immediately he jumped on it and got a hold of some people and came up with his renderings and uh, that's where we are today and we're trying to get uh, Fairboard to uh, accept our idea as a, a plausible means of, of, of happening. And it's, it's so essential, they want to put a lot of money behind this. The fairgrounds needs reinventing. It's one of my favorite places to go. You know, they have the flea markets um, once a month and I've gone there. but. Um, I noticed that the, that the once a year fair started dwindling in population and then there was some fear that the whole thing was going to go away. So this is the city's attempt to really revitalize this space and bring it back. Exactly. And so tell us, Isaac, um, what are your ideas for how to do that? Well, the first idea was how do I get out of India where I've lived for five years and I'm working on a totally different project. <laughs> but my friend Swan called me and because I've been a Tennessean and my family's been around here a long time and I lived in Nashville, uh, it really became a labor of love because Nashville, at one time, musicians and so forth weren't at the top of the pit pile like it is now. It wasn't Music City. It was There was a sort of a disconnect the last 10 years. Finally, I think Nashville has accepted the fact that uh, this is what put, put this city on the map. I was about to say Memphis because the same thing happened in Memphis. Uh, they had no respect at the beginning for Elvis Presley or Stax or Sun, and now they realize that that's what they're famous for around the world. So it seems like some of these towns are the last to understand what the rest of the world thinks of them. The Nashville just stepped out on the world stage three weeks ago when they announced the Grammys. Uh, you turn on the TV set, and I've just been here from India for a couple of weeks, but it's Music City this, it's Music City at the end of every news show, it's Music City, Music City. And the first thing I thought about, because I created the project in India with some Japanese architects and some people from Canada that were working on my other project, 
the first thing that we really realized was that uh, Nashville has lost millions and millions and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 20 years as tourists would come here looking for music, which was the offering of Music City, and there was no place to really see the music. Uh, you got all this money was stolen by Branson, Missouri, and Dollywood, and Graceland, and several other places. And the tourists, I think, did not really get a taste of what Nashville has to offer. Uh, Nashville is now probably the music capital of the world, having lived in LA and many other cities. Um, there's more musicians here, there's more songwriters, studios. Uh, probably there is more recording being done here, and it's not just country music anymore, it's gospel and rock and you know, a whole lot of other things as well. So the idea was to create a destination where there was lots of music, first class restaurants, uh, a new, new type of idea that really would create a destination location, not just for tourists, but also for the people of Nashville and the whole Mid-South area. Uh, if you, I did a House of Blues in New Orleans, spent a lot of time there, and what draws the French Quarter every weekend, 70% of the people drive in from 200 miles away. So the idea was let's create a really hot destination location that will bring not just tourists here, but will be something the whole city could be proud of and, and would also attract a lot of people to the new music city. It's such a gorgeous location, too. It would mean so much, you're right, not just for the city of Nashville, but the country. Well, it's, uh, it's very interesting because that place has been there since 1820. It is probably the most nostalgic piece of property that exists in the city. And I think that when I got here, I found out, oh my God, this has been a hot potato for about five years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the city has risen up time after time after time after again when they wanted to sell it or turn it into a hospital or offices or this or that and said, no, this belongs to us. And so with that in mind, I began this design, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, what we call Nashville Skyline. Cool. Um, we have some slides to yeah, show the folks at home what's absolutely. going on. Let's take a look at some of the renderings and some of the work that Isaac Tigret has come up with. So this is um, Nashville Skyline is the name of the project. Yes, indeed. It's also the name of a little Bob Dylan <laughs> album. Um, yes. Okay, so it says including new concert hall, offices, and expo center, and that's a rendering um, that's beautiful. I'm trying to orient where on the fairgrounds that is. Is that the racetrack? Actually, uh, what we did is we realized that the cheapest way to do this was to, and all I had was Google Maps to deal with in India, <laughs> but the cheapest way to do this, uh, which would cut out 50, 60 percent of the time and cash, was to use the existing buildings as much as possible. They've already got their capacities, they've got the city codes passed, they've got their sprinkler systems, they've got their exits, they've got everything. And they're actually, atomic weapon could fall on those things. I've never seen such steel beams when I went through the other day. I was just, I was amazed at how powerful these buildings were built in those days. But that's the only way that this project can be financially viable as far as building is concerned. And it can be done a lot cheaper than some of the other plans I've seen submitted there. Okay, so what's the um, new media broadcasting center and the online subscription service that you'd like to offer. Well, why don't we go through some of the okay. slides Let's first. Go. Uh, this is. Uh, oh, no way, an IMAX theater? Well, it's not just an IMAX theater, it's also a 4,000 seat venue, which the city yeah. needs very much. We talked to some of the promoters, and during my House of Blues days, we were doing about 18,000 shows a year out of a number of places. and. I spent my whole life with musicians. Uh, I've actually seen more dawns than I've had hot dinners, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> and uh, where are they now? And uh, so we saw that they needed this size venue in the town very much. So, so we designed one. It's one of the new constructions. Uh, the, the next slide is we've taken, there's an office building on the left because we thought officing would be important. It's important to understand that we've also made this the most eco uh, eccentric place that we can. Even the glass in these buildings is a new modern technology which the, the, you can actually, it's translucent, but it takes all the UV filters out. This, the one on the right, is actually the existing uh, arts building there and we see raising it three stories and creating a very large expo center there and, and moving the expo center there. Those dark things are solar panels. Oh my goodness. Which you won't see uh, there, but we're using 
solar, wind, and everything else that we possibly can. I've been very much involved in that movement for a long time. Well, that's gorgeous. I think that's going to help everything. Just well, it's showing. essential. This is the first project of its kind that has two unique features, actually. One of them is a, a, literally going completely solar and wind and saving, we think, about 30% of the cost of running electricity there. Wow. All right, let's go. Okay, T-Bone Supper Club. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is, uh, again, I, what we're going to see now is a series of pictures of existing buildings that are there that have been simply re rehabilitated. Uh, T-Bone Supper Club is a very top-end, high-end place. It has these beautiful booths down one side and a, a beautiful bar down the other. Uh, it actually transforms into a nightclub late at night. The back of the bar moves across in front of the open kitchen. You can't really see the bottom of the slide, but all the booths go into pocket doors. And at 10, 10 o'clock at night, a stage is suddenly appears behind the bar. And uh, I think the next slide shows it. Oh, party time. Yeah. So all the booze have uh, disappeared. <laughs> yeah. And you can see on the right, the, the stage is behind the bar. And this whole back bar has moved. I, I, I'm sort of famous for this crazy stuff. If anyone ever went to the House of Blues in L.A., mm -hmm. they, they know that this bar opens magically and it exposes this whole nightclub below. So the idea is to try to use every single venue for as many hours of the day as you can. So not only we'd be having breakfast, lunch, and dinner there, and a very nice happy hour, I hope, but then later at night, it turns into a venue for about 300, 400 people. That is awesome. I love that design. The multi-use um, feature of it makes it really, it's like a real living space. Uh, this, this is really exciting. This is the, the next building okay. over that exists now. We've changed the roof a little bit. And I got fascinated. I'm a barbecue freak. Uh, I helped start the barbecue festival down in Memphis when we had about 5,000 visitors in a parking lot. Of course, it's 500,000 now. We can go back just one more, brother. Okay. And uh, you got that? Yeah, it's right up. <laughs> no, I wanted to make sure he's got me. No, that's good. That's good. Um, but uh, the oldest barbecue restaurant in the world is in Mason, Tennessee, and it's called Bozo's Hot Pit Barbecue. It was founded in 1923. It's still there today. And I actually got the rights to the name because I think it is such a fantastic place, and it's very famous for its barbecue to barbecue fans worldwide. So again, we're creating a venue that uh, is very sophisticated in its own way, although T-Bones, which you saw earlier, is skewed towards an older and it's probably more like a Ruth Chris or a, you know, some of the more expensive restaurants. This is skewed more towards families and, and folks in general. So if we can move to the next slide, brother. Uh, on the outside, uh, there was a, because this is going to be hopefully a go cup area if the state will give us permission to do so. We expect about four or 5,000 people wandering the property because it's a whole entertainment district. Go Cup meaning drinking beer? Drinking anything. All like right. You, like you have on Beale Street. The state or in Key West. That. Yeah. Beale Street, Bourbon Street, yeah. so forth and so on. Okay. Uh, we think that's what, what it calls for. But this is open. It's a barbecue pit outside, and you have to cook barbecue the whole time. So anybody in the, in the whole entertainment district can go in and get a barbecue sandwich wow. or whatever they want. So exciting. This is the inside of Bozos. Uh, there's all these sort of roadside attraction, ancient banners from the whole idea of this idea of Bozos. It's sort of family, midway, state fair, of course, uh, and, fa and music. So here is the uh, first form of Bozos. It's got opposing bars and, uh, and also these beautiful banners go all the way around it. Then uh, the banners go away and reveal, uh, you've now doubled the capacity, reveal the whole balcony with bars and places to eat and so forth. Uh, then you can see at the far right there is the stage, and I think your guy is going to show this stage, uh, this eating platform you see it now actually moves all the way to the very front of the place. So one of the dream of everybody in my business is I always wanted to look full. Yeah. So we've designed a thing so that this whole wall goes right to the front and as more people come it comes back and it's sort of theater waiters come out put tables down and so forth till eventually uh, you know it's at full capacity. That, that eating platform at the right actually is a stage for music 
and once you get everybody in there you can have about six or seven hundred seated or I think the next slide shows that with the tables and chairs out we will hold approximately 1500 people and this is for live music. This is going to create a lot of jobs. Yes, it's going to create thousands of jobs thousands in this place. Of jobs. And uh, also make a lot of money too. Good. For the city or whomever. Yeah, the city. And so moving ahead on the slides, we have the Wilson Building. Yeah, this is a, again the, the existing buildings and we wanted to have an entrance to the district. Uh, and so this was a study that was looking at the buildings that exist. And you can see at the top there, these are the famous sheds that are mm -hmm. there now that are monstrous and wonderful. Uh, you want to go to the next one? Okay, so we took the middle section, which is just an opening that goes through, and we created an entrance to the entertainment district and Nashville Skyline. On the right is a very hip uh, diner that's open 24 hours a day called 24-7. Nice. And on the left, uh, and this is really the most exciting part for me, um, my own son is a drummer for The Who, Zach Starkey, and he'll probably die like most musicians and songwriters in newspaper on a park someday because there's no annuities for them. There's, you know. So the idea was to, uh, it's not Swanee, come on, man. Have a sense of humor, brother. Tell it like it is, this Isaac. Is we can this handle is, it. I'm working, brother. I'm working on what you're doing. But, um, the point being is that uh, I came up with a new model, and it, it, it is totally a new model, of having a partnership between a profit and nonprofit organization. And I figured out a way also how to fund it, and this I call United Artists Charitable Trust. I think we <coughs> can probably get somewhere around two or three million dollars a year out of this place for them in a very unique way, which if you go to the website it explains it, it's a little difficult. But I essentially, here. it's it's a fund that's set up to take care of artists and musicians. Exactly. With, with Health, insurance, insurance, uh, place to stay. We try to start something for extreme sports. It was the same kind of thing. You have your day in the sun, and then you know it's hard once you've given your life over to something to have support after. So, well, this place is is dedicated to the musicians in in this town and songwriters and all the studio technicians and engineers. There are 14 stages here altogether. Wow. So there is a place that people can come to and if they want to see Music City in action they can from very small venues where lots of labels are premiering young talent uh, of 100 to 150 and you'll see in a moment we created something we call Skyline Music Row of our own and uh, right up into the four, four or five thousand seater so it goes up in stages from you know, 100 to 500 to 1500 to 2000 to four or 5000. Wow, that's amazing. I can't, I wish I could go there right now. Well, we're, we're going. Okay, we're, let's, let's go, let's keep slide. going. <laughs> uh, this is a bizarre building. Uh, it's called the Vaughn Building, it exists now. It's 312 or 13 feet long. And we've created something to honor uh, musicians. This whole thing is about honoring musicians, so we call it the Tennessee Three Rockabilly Blues Brother Bar, and it, it'll be called T3s, but the Tennessee Three was Johnny Cash's original band, mm -hmm. and in that band was Carl Perkins and right. a guy named Holland from Jackson, Tennessee. So that's why we call it the Tennessee Three, to honor them. The original Memphis Blues Brothers band, which Paul Schaefer put together, uh, included Steve Cropper, Duck Dunn, Matt Guitar Murphy, Willie Hall, all Booker T and the MGs, plus many others. So we're dedicating this place to them. Cool. There'll be three stages here. It'll be the longest bar in the world, by the way. Whoa! <laughs> but uh, as one stage closes down, the next one opens up, so there'll be continuous music going on on all three stages, one after another. Fabulous. So we call it the T3. Amazing. Uh, Rock City. Yes, uh, I did this because I'm a redneck from Jackson, Tennessee, and anyone oh, else yeah. that wandered around would see Sea Rock City stuck on the yeah. top of everything. So we're making this a barn-like structure. This is actually the sports center that exists already. We're just changing the outside by putting some, you know, clapboard like a wooden barn would be, which you see everywhere the red barns, the black roof, and. We call it the Red House Music, Dancing, and Cocktails. And I think I've got a Funks Hybrid label down there on the left and the FFA on the right, Future Farmers of America. 
uh, because that's the way these places looked. And so I thought it would be a lot of fun. This place will hold about 1,800, 1,900 people. It's uh, strictly for music and dancing. Mm -hmm. So there will be two sound systems, as you have to have for live music and for dancing. But Nashville needs a really great dance hall as well as a hall that this is this big that can handle uh, certain acts. This is 24-7, the, <laughs> the sort of hook, cool, hip, and trendy diner that will be there. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see, I think, an interior shot. Uh, as you can see, there's sofas and so forth and a board about what's, who's coming soon. And this will be open 24 hours a day, as will the barbecue Bozo's Smokehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, are we, I was looking for a word that had RV in it because <laughs> I wanted an RV park. You're the only man alive who saw <laughs> RV in the word Nirvana. <laughs> That's true. So, uh, you know, people my age, and as you can see, I'm sure as people see me on this show, it's my arthritis going, uh, you know, my age group is retiring in mass and they're becoming gypsies. You know, the children don't like them and they don't want to watch TV. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're getting RVs and they're going everywhere. Yeah. And even though we've been in a recession, they're just soaring. So RVs have been a big part of even the culture, especially in the southeast. So we wanted to create a really fantastic RV park for these people where you don't want to stay one day and move on in some parking lot that just has a hookup for, for whatever under a street light. But create, as you can see, because of the foliage that's already on site, we can create a really exciting, wonderful place to park your RV and hopefully we'll get them to stay a couple of days. Because yeah, that's the key to that business. It's as many days as you can. It might take them two days to go through the longest bar. Yeah, yeah. the longest bar. And there's a lot of bird life in the uh, yes. RV. And we're going to have a hospital for them, too, <laughs> so they leave any of the bars there. <laughs> Maybe you just one of the RVs will be like a medevac thing. Why it's not? A yeah, mobile Why not? one, yeah. Why not? Um, all right. All right. We, one of the things that's happening, if you've hung out in Tokyo recently or London or New York. Fortunately, I haven't. <laughs> uh, well, I have and do. And one of the hot things that's happening now all over the world is something called a pod room. It's a very tiny hotel room. Uh, they have them everywhere in Asia and Europe now, and so they're very inexpensive. So it gives the traveler, the young traveler, a business person or whatever, the opportunity to stay in a hip place, but not spend a lot of money. They're right. prefab rooms. So we have from small rooms to suites in this particular thing. And I, I love this project. This actually comes from Denmark. It's a prefab idea. Um, and as you can see, there's a huge dome on the top, which will be probably one of the largest lobbies to meet and greet and have fun and have, do business and so forth. So we call it the Nashville Skyline Capsule Hotel. Whoa, and how, how big or small, I should say, would the smallest capsule be? Uh, the smallest room would be about the size of, uh, they're usually, because we did this, we had a, a House of Blues Hotel in Chicago that we did. I took 40 of the rooms and split them. So they're about nine feet wide and about 12 or 13 feet long, but everything is compartmentalized. Right, you got so a flat little, screen the, TV yeah, and a little, little bathroom, which is, has all, everything in it. And so you can charge a much less fee, plus it's prefab, as many of these things that we're doing are prefab. Cool. I love that. Uh, this is a fun thing that I thought would to promote Nashville and Music City. These are tractor trailer trucks, and they would go to NASCAR or to sporting events or Roll Tide <laughs> down in Alabama where everybody tailgates. And one of the trucks is, a, is an alcoholic truck, which will be probably swaying back and forth most of the time. <laughs> you have a music truck, which they actually exist already, where music will be played. And on the right, you have your food truck. But I thought it'd be great to have a traveling version of Nashville Skyline going around promoting what we do. Here we are at either a Super Bowl venue or whatever. And when it is not in use, and corporate gigs will be another big thing, uh, when it's not in use, we'll have it out in the parking lot at Nashville Skylines during the summer months, so it'll be a really exciting outdoor sort of venue. I love these renderings, too. They're so... <clears throat> Thank you. This is, uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, when I first came to Nashville, I must have been 14 or 15, illegally driving my car and uh, from Jackson, <coughs> and I wanted to see Music Row, the famous Music Row. 
And uh, at three minutes after driving down Music Row, I'd seen the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going, well, where's the music? And I thought it meant you could go into these houses. But of course, it's a wonderful landmark with all these 1950s single family homes that have been turned into publishing houses and studios and so forth. So what we did, if we can go back to that slide, we took two of the sheds, which are 300 something feet long, we put them together and we're actually putting six or seven of these little 1950s houses in here, a main street with trees, so that you can get 18, probably 2,000 people in there. Um, so people can walk down the street and in each one of these little houses will be a venue that's showing you the music that you want to go see when you walk down Music Row in the first place. So one of them might be doing country, one might be doing gospel, one might be doing rock, pop, Latin, whatever, so that people could actually experience in mass in a wonderful place in this make-believe world of a real street with street lights and trees and everything else and all these old, old houses and go in. And this is the perfect type of venue for the young up-and-coming artists, about 100 to 125 people, about the size of my first house of blues in Harvard Square. <laughs> wow, <laughs> but, so cool. uh, So this is where people can be showcased and then move up as they get fans to the next place. And the labels will love this, I think, because they oh. can showcase all, the, showcase all their artists and so forth. But we call it Skyline Music Row. And uh, again, it's 340 feet long, and we have a light well down the top of it so the trees will grow. <laughs> but it'll have sidewalks and a street and grass, and it'll look just like a normal street. It'll look like Music Row, except you can go into every one of these venues and see some great music. Great idea. Uh, there's sort of an overview of that entertainment district, which you can see T-Bones is hidden far on the left. You have Bozo's, you have the United Artists Charitable Trust, which actually that building is an exotic car showroom. So uh, we see a lot of people and talk to a lot of people who would love to donate their car because every dollar that comes into that place to go and visit these cars goes to the trust. And the other way, which we're going to make money, which is so obvious, all these businesses have to pay federal income tax. We're going to require each operator to not pay the federal income tax, which they would enjoy, but to give it to the United Artists Charitable Trust, which they can legally write off on their income tax. Right. So you will have a continuous supply of cash coming to these folks through this very simple scheme. Amazing. But you sort of get it all there. This is the most exciting part to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the very first time sound, I'm going to brag a little bit here. Please. I do often, actually. <laughs> I haven't heard you brag yet. I've been waiting. <laughs> well, um, the very first time any music was ever heard on the web uh, ever around the world was in 1995 from the House of Blues, Martin Luther King Day. And Al Gore, who I grew up with, was kind enough to lend me something called the M-Bone. No one knew that there was sound on the web. He told me about it. I borrowed it. Uh, it was an extraordinary day. We had Stevie Wonder played, Isaac Hayes, Public Enemy. We had all these civil rights speakers. And this is pre-Mosaic, pre-real audio, pre-everything. So we didn't even know if anyone was out there listening. It was pre-email, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and it was just young people in those days. The web was so cool when it was first exploded on the scene. It was all youthful and marvelous. And people picked up the phone and called a friend. You're not going to believe it, this sound on the web. Well, about six months later, Real Audio came along, and we were doing these 18,000 shows. We had the software, so we started broadcasting just about every night, and we'd get two or 300,000 uh, people coming to see these shows around the world mm -hmm. before the servers would crash, and, we, <laughs> and we'd run out and see what was going to happen because the equipment was so archaic compared to today. So the idea is that we will broadcast from every stage, all 13, 14 stages, we will broadcast every night to the world. Uh, it'll be a membership based is what the formula is now. And let's say it's a dollar a person, you know, and you have uh, per month. Uh, and so you have, I think I get a million subscribers in America alone and I, I ascertain from my limited experience, we can probably get five million in the first three or four years around the world, uh, that's about $60 million that you can make in broadcasting. And what's so cool about this, we've designed a system and we're working with several big companies that 
uh, stream the Olympics and so forth, and with the wonderful people here at, at Talkopolis as well will be involved, of course. And God bless them for even having us on. But the idea is that you'll have six stationary cameras in each one of these venues. So when you come to Nashville Skyline as a member, you can actually self-edit your own view of the performance. In other words, you can go to every camera, one's full on with the stage, one side stage, one's from the back of the stage, so that you can actually it's called live editing, your own view of that performance, or you can go to another venue and see what's going on there, or another, or another. Uh, it'll be a great value for money, but the most important thing is, as I said before, Nashville has just entered the world stage. Yeah. When the Grammys were signed two weeks ago, Nashville has become now an, an internationally known town. And it should be. It's Music City. So what this will do for Nashville in my humble opinion, which actually you can see I'm not that humble. <laughs> but uh, I use that word. Yes, well, I, I do use it occasionally. It depends on who I'm with, Swan. <laughs> but uh, what it will do for Nashville on the international stage, it, it will bring not only tourists here, but it will also give them the destination that brought them here in the first place. Uh, I think that Nashville, uh, with their new Civic Center, that they need something like this as a destination location to really be a world-class city. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with Broadway, but there just isn't that many big joints down there, and they're all wonderful. And you know, I went to Tootsie's when I was a kid, you know, and it's great. But I don't think you can get more than 50 people in there, you know, or so. Uh, and I'm sure they'll all do well down there for sure. But they need an adjunct to that for not just conventioners, but for all the tourists that come to Nashville. So this, I think, will probably raise several million, if not more, dollars in, for the local businesses, for taxes, for the city, for you know, uh, restaurants, for hotels, for everything. I think you'll add a day, maybe even two, to people's visits here. So this does many things. It's broadcasting. That's why we're online right now, because it's, it's the medium. And you put this on a world basis, and you have millions of people watching, you really take Nashville to a whole new level in awareness. And if you're going to call it Music City, you bloody well better have the music when you get here. I, I completely agree. I think that Nashville needs something like this. I think your plan is genius to help transform <laughs> the fairgrounds into a world-class enter entertainment and destination Thank venue. You. How can um, Nashvillians uh, learn more? or maybe get involved in what you guys are working on? Well, you know, this is, uh, I didn't realize till I got here, but this is a political hot potato. Apparently it's been an argument for about five years and there have been many different plans put forward. And I know that the Metro Council now has an organization that's supposed to come up with some planning and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. I had no idea. I did this as a labor of love because I enjoyed doing this sort of thing. And I don't really want anything out of it except health insurance, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> okay, good. We can so, handle uh, that. I think that uh, if people, the, see, the one thing that I don't think the other folks with certain ideas had is the word nostalgia. This place is nostalgic to the people of Nashville in many ways. Uh, it's been here since 1820. Andrew Jackson had his race course there. You know, in 1909, they started racing there. In fact, the leading horse uh, of the era actually is buried in the middle of the speedway <laughs> from the 1800s. Um, but I think people want to see it stay there. I don't think they want to move somewhere else. I think they want to see it redone. The city very wisely wants to come up with a plan that's not going to financially hurt their pocketbook. Uh, this plan, in my opinion, not only is inexpensive compared to others I've seen, but it also makes a lot of money. So it isn't just a civic project that you throw a bunch of money at and you never see any return. This thing is built as all my businesses were or ideas or things I've consulted for before and I'm just a consultant in this case. Um, make money. This could be a real golden goose. It could be for the city for sure. Thank you so much Isaac Tigret and pleasure. Swan Burris has been here as well to help explain to us what is happening with Project Nashville Skyline. We will let you know as things develop and thank you so much for being here on the Thanks, show. Thanks Best of luck. It. Okay we'll see you next time. For more information and updates please go to Facebook and check out Project Nashville Skyline and give it a like while you're at it.